Hi everyone, this is what happened to me when I got government housing part 17 and I've got this photo here because um, we actually had a hailstorm in Melbourne last night and there was literally hail everywhere and um, with like little balls of, of ice, perfect circles, they were or spheres more, more precisely but um, anyway that's what um, the local park looked like. Um, so it's freezing here in Melbourne and um, I'm going to continue telling me my story and um, I'll just continue talking about the incidents um, as they occurred and in this video I also wanted to tell you about my experiences in court and some of the things that I think should be changed about the court process and to know that photo there is not the Melbourne Magistrates Court it's a different icy cold place um, so anyway on the 2nd of the 5th 2016 I was walking down the street when the respondent was following me on a bicycle um, so this was another vehicle that he was using and another way in which he was stalking me. Apart from being stalked for such a long time, which was exhausting as you could imagine, it was the variety of techniques that the respondent used which caused problems for me as well. Obviously, if he had one vehicle, I could just look out for that vehicle and try to be safe. But because he had so many vehicles and would come up with new ways of following me, I never knew when I was safe. And also, you should note that he used a variety of methods to assault me. He tried to punch me, he drove a vehicle into me, he dumped buckets of water on me, and he verbally assaulted me and goaded me. And this kept me in a state of constant fear because I never knew what was safe to do or what he would do next. So for this incident where he was following me, that was an act of stalking, but I don't believe I rang the police. I certainly didn't um, record it in, in my diary, so I don't have that here as, as me reporting that as an incident, but it was. The other thing that happened on that day is that I received a letter from the officer who attended about my washing machine and I thought that was interesting because I don't remember receiving a letter from the police who attended about any of the other incidents and also I've shown you the video of the police attendants about my washing machine you can see how hostile the police are and what their attitude was and also what was written about me in the LEAP report and that shows what their attitude towards me was but it appears that even an officer who has a bad attitude towards me was doing a better job than the others because as we can see this officer also you know logged the the incident and sent me a letter about it um, and I didn't understand that and I didn't understand why the other officers didn't obviously log any of the other incidents but by the same token I didn't understand about 99% of what was happening to me at that time anyway. So on the 4th of the 5th 2016 I tried to get out my front door um, to do my washing at the local laundrette because as we know I didn't have a washing machine anymore and I couldn't afford to buy another one so I had to go to the laundrette. Doing my washing at the laundry costs around $30 a week and um, if I couldn't afford to wash my clothes and I had no alternative um, I didn't want to ask one of the neighbours to use their machine because I didn't want to be ambushed by the respondent in the laundry. <sighs> So um, that meant that I just had to keep wearing clothes that needed to be washed. Um, that extra $30 a week that I was spending at the laundrette was money that I needed. 
obviously for for myself um and um as you know i was just a pensioner and the fact that i it was just another incurred expense from everything that was happening to me and it was pushing me further into financial hardship after all of the other expenses that i had incurred since all of this started and it was unbearable i knew that i couldn't afford to go on another holiday and i couldn't afford private accommodation but um now it had gotten to the point where I couldn't afford to have clean clothes. And I believe that all of this can be traced back to a combination of two things. That is obviously the respondent's behavior that was criminal violence and property damage, and also the duty failure of the police who consistently refused to help me. Then on the 5th of the 5th, 2016, I had to go back to the Melbourne Magistrates Court to vary the order that was made on the 31st of the 3rd, 2016. So that's um, me having to go back to court to alter the order, the intervention order that was granted to me on the 31st of the 3rd, 2016. Um, the reason why I did that is because at that hearing the judge actually removed my daughter from the order and he did that without explanation. I don't know why he removed her and I don't know what gave him the right to do that. Obviously me and my daughter were equal in needing the protection of an intervention order and the way I saw it I was her mother and I wanted her name next to mine on the order. She lived with me and had nothing to do with the respondent as I had nothing to do with him either. So I couldn't see any reason why she would be removed. Um, and now I was the one who had to go back to court and have her name put back on the order because a judge who didn't know me decided that she should be taken off it. I think that what the judge did was outrageous and I think that the the situation in which a judge can just remove someone's child from an order is outrageous. And um, I don't think the judge had any right to remove my daughter and certainly not without explaining why they were doing it. I think that if a mother wants their child on an order and the child is under 18 and living with them, then they should be allowed to have them on the order. I had to spend my time and my money getting my daughter back onto the intervention order that I took out because I had been repeatedly assaulted and I was nothing more than a pensioner. I didn't finish high school and I was being forced to download legal documents from the internet, to print them out, to fill them out, to attend court, to speak to judges and to represent myself in court. It was draining and expensive and I shouldn't have had to deal with any of it. Then on the 11th of the 5th 2016 I managed to get out my front door to go to the laundrette to wash my clothes. I got back at about 12.45 and I was going to put the the wet clothes that, I, that I'd washed in my dryer which was in the laundry opposite my unit when I found that the power wasn't working. When I went inside, I checked my fuse box and I saw that the power was out, so I turned on the switch and turned it back on again. I went back inside, sorry, I went back outside to my dryer and I found that it still wasn't working. And then I discovered that someone had actually cut the cord of my, um, my tumble dryer. I rang Triple O and I reported that as an incident and, um, yeah, obviously a, a crime. And an officer rang me sometime after that saying that no one could attend, but that they would send me a report. And I don't know why they said that they would send me a report when no one had attended. Um, and the officer that I spoke to also said that they may attend the following day. But um, to date, no officer has contacted me about that incident. 
Another thing that I wanted to say is that I always ask the police to contact me in writing, whether by email or by text, to make sure that I know that they've tried to contact me and also so I can keep a record of it. Most of the police that I've dealt with refuse to do this and they insist that they'll just attend my home, which is clearly an ineffective way of contacting someone. I don't know why the police have an issue with putting things in writing, but I think that it should be standard practice for police to contact people by email or hard copy mail. It should be understood that there is very little chance of catching someone when they're, um, when they're available if you turn up to their home without asking permission to do so. I would like someone to calculate the odds of someone being there if another person randomly drives over to their home and knocks on their door. I think this would be an interesting statistic and it may help people like me to convince the police that writing to people is a fairer way of getting hold of them.